Hi, it's Katrina. My friend David is going to be helping me out with the voiceover today, so I hope you enjoy. Today I'll be exploring stories from the Bible that were told thousands of years before the Bible was even written. Stories about an ancient flood, tales of horrifying demons, and the true inspirations behind the Bible's most famous characters. The Flood one of the most famous stories of the Bible is Noah and the Flood. If you ask 10 people on the street, all 10 of them are going to know who Noah is and all about his ark. But if you ask those same 10 people about Atrahasis and the Sumerian Deluge, they'll most likely scratch their heads in confusion. The Epic of the Great Flood is a story told in Akkadian folklore and Babylonian myth, though the tale originated with the earliest of the Sumerians. According to the ancient story written down about 1700 years before Jesus Christ, there was a flood that destroyed the world. The Sumerian god Enki, who was one of the Anunnaki, warned only one man of the incoming disaster. That man was Atrahasis. Enki told Atrahasis that he better build an ark to save himself and load it with two of every kind of animal to preserve natural life. The story of Noah is a direct copy of the story of Atrahasis, down to every last detail. But the story of Atrasis is a copy of an even older story. During the reign of Babylonian king Amni Sadduka, between 1646 and 1626 BC, Atrasis' story was written down. 700 years earlier, around 2300 BC, the story Eridu Genesis was told. The Eridu Genesis told the story of angry gods unleashing a flood upon the world, but allowing one man by the name of Udnapishtim to survive on a boat. The story is repeated in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And guess what? It's also told in an ancient Egyptian text called the Book of the Heavenly Cow, written around 2181 BC. The Egyptian version talks about the sun god Ra's creation of humanity. Humans rebelled against Ra, causing him to become angry and destroy them. Ra sent the goddess Hathor to annihilate the pesky humans, though not with a flood. Hathor slaughtered humans the old-fashioned way with violence. Ra changed his mind halfway through the slaughter and humanity was saved on the back of Nut, the sky goddess who took the form of a heavenly cow. The Egyptian version isn't quite the same as the other versions, but all the pieces are there. The story of humans rebelling against the gods, then the gods striking them down, is as old as time itself. There are so many flood myths that even modern scientists are fairly certain the ancient world was, in some way, affected by a devastating cataclysm, the Jesus problem. I'm going to introduce you to a character from an ancient myth. This character was the son of God, born in a cave, with his birth announced by an angel. A star in the sky heralded the child's arrival. At the age of 30, he was baptized in a river. The one who baptized him was later beheaded by an angry king. This character had 12 disciples. He was known for performing miracles and raising the dead. He even walked on water. People called him things like the Good Shepherd and the Lamb of God. Upon his death, he was buried for three days and then rose from the dead. This sounds a lot like Jesus, right? Except it isn't Jesus. It's Horus, an Egyptian god worshipped thousands of years before Jesus Christ was supposedly born. And while historians have debated the authenticity of Horus's story, whether he truly was born of a virgin or if he really had 12 disciples, his myth is strikingly similar to the myth of Jesus. It's not the only one either. Many gods throughout history had stories nearly identical to the tale of Jesus in the Bible. In Greek myth, Asclepius was the god of healing and medicine. Many parts of the Jesus mythos have been attributed to Asclepius. Jesus also shares familiarities with Hermes and Zeus. December 25th was the birthday of Sol Invictus, the Roman sun god. And when it comes to dying, then rising as a god, this concept can be found all throughout the ancient world. The Greek hero Adonis is famous for having gained his immortality after his death. The Sumerian god Tammuz rose from the dead and so did Osiris in Egyptian myth. Getting back to Horus, his iconography in ancient Egypt is also similar to the iconography of Jesus in Christianity, specifically the images of Isis and Horus. Isis was Horus's mother, seen in countless works of art nursing the young deity. If you look at pictures of Isis and Horus next to images of the Virgin Mary nursing the baby Jesus, they are nearly identical. Maybe Jesus wasn't a direct ripoff of one particular god. Still, there's no denying the comparisons between Jesus and a dozen gods that came before him. A storm of demons. When you think about demons, perhaps you imagine red-skinned imps with pitchforks and pointed tails. But the Christian version of the demon is not the only version. Demons have been terrorizing humanity for thousands of years. 
Independent scholar Wael Sherbini recently came across two demons painted on a pair of coffins from 4,000 years ago in ancient Egypt. He also found an example of a demon on a leather scroll from the same time period. The scroll had been stored on a shelf at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo and forgotten about for the last 70 years. These three demons are now the oldest known depictions of demonic entities ever found in Egypt. In Egypt, demons were known as Intep, but nobody was ever sure what exactly they looked like because there were no images of them from four millennia ago. Now that's all changed. These newly identified images show demons as anthropomorphic freaks. One of the demons was painted to look like a dog mixed with a baboon. The texts found along with the demon associated with Doth, god of the moon and god of magic. Even in the earliest days of Egypt, demons were connected to practitioners of magic, just like demons being associated today with witches. Plus, they were most definitely evil. In another of the examples, text found with the demon described the creature as cutting people's heads off as punishment for invading sacred spaces. Another of the demons is shown as the guardian of a fiery gate, drawn as a huge black bird with a cat head, Job the copycat. The Ludlul Bal Nameki is an ancient Sumerian poem written somewhere around 1700 BC. The theme of the poem is one of suffering and the woes of unjust misery. It's one of the most famous works of Mesopotamian literature, but it's also believed to be the inspiration behind the biblical book of Job. The Sumerian narrative follows a man named Shubshi Meshri Shakan. He's described as a tormented man. He has been faithful to the god Marduk all of his life, yet still he suffers and does not know why. Much of the book is about his speculation over the state of things and what is truly good in the world. In the poetic work, Shubshi is suddenly beset by misfortune for no obvious reason. People plot against him, he incurs the wrath of the king, and he loses his property. His health fails him and he wallows in utter misery. It gets so bad that he ends up on his deathbed, just waiting to die. Then, at the last moment, a priest is sent by Marduk and Shubshi is restored to his former health. Suddenly, his life isn't so bad. The biggest point of the story is that even though Shubshi was tormented on every step of the journey and it seemed as if the gods had forsaken him, he kept his faith and was rewarded in the end. It's the message that parallels the book of Job so much. For those unfamiliar with Job's story, let me give you a quick recap. Just like Shubshi, Job was a man of great wealth and piety, but soon he became entrenched in misery and hardship. Job lost everything near and dear to him, he lost his possessions, his property, his children, and then his health. Just like Shubshi, Job ended up at death's door after enduring unspeakable sadness. But through it all, he refused to curse God and kept his faith. The biggest difference between the two stories is the date they were written. The Sumerian composition was written at least a thousand years before the Hebrew version, making the Bible a copycat yet again. Enki and the Anunnaki in the Babylonian creation myth, six generations of gods lived upon the earth. These gods were the Anunnaki, believed by the people of Mesopotamia to have come down from the heavens to colonize the planet. The Anunnaki were the creators of the cosmos, but also star travelers. Although the Anunnaki were worshipped by the Sumerians, as far back as 6,000 years ago, they continued to play a major role in world religion all the way to the days of Jesus Christ. Some of the most important Anunnaki gods like Marduk even appear in the Bible. After six generations of Anunnaki gods living peacefully upon the planet, they became lazy. The seventh generation known as the younger Ijiji gods no longer wanted to perform their duties. They were sick of working and keeping all of creation going. This newest generation were the sons and daughters of Enlil and Ninlil, born before human beings had been created. They went on strike, refusing to work. Abzu, god of fresh water, threatened to drown the world in a flood because of the new generation's laziness. This led to a bunch of drama. The god Enki put Abzu to sleep and then trapped him underneath the city of Eridu. The mother goddess Tiamat grew angry and threatened to destroy all of creation. It was a stressful mess for all the gods involved. In the end, the young gods triumphed. Tiamat was destroyed and ripped apart, then thrown into the heavens. When all was said and done, there was still a problem that needed to be solved. The gods didn't want to work anymore and needed somebody to do their work for them. Enki suggested creating servants out of clay and blood, and thus the first men were born. This story does mirror the tale of Adam and Eve a little bit. It also has some fragments of the Flood myth in it. But it's also this story that has spawned the myth of humans being created by aliens to mine the planet for precious resources. 
One of the most popular theories these days is that the Anunnaki were aliens who created humans to be slaves. Then, when the human slaves finished mining all that the Anunnaki wanted, the aliens left the planet. They abandoned humans to their own fate. The Sumerian legend of Enki and the Lazy Gods is where this modern conspiracy theory comes from. But first, it's shout-out time. I wanted to give a big thank you to Aurora Curvora and Nick Wentworth5371 for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. Adam and Eve. At the beginning of time, there was chaos in the vastness of space. Then came order as God shaped the heavens and the earth. The first humans were formed from the clay of the world and allowed to live in paradise without pain or hardship. These lucky individuals were the first couple in the world, the first man and the first woman. In Christianity, they are known as Adam and Eve. But are Adam and Eve cheap imitations of original couples from older stories told in China, Egypt and Mesopotamia? Almost every culture that has ever existed had a creation myth. It makes sense for a civilization to tell stories that explain where they came from, but a lot of them are similar to the Adam and Eve story, especially the parts about humans being fashioned from clay and being tricked into sinning by an evil entity. In many of the tales, it's also a woman who takes the blame for letting sin into the world. But before I delve into the other Adams and Eves, there's something important about the Bible you need to know. There are two very different versions of the Adam and Eve myth in the Bible. In chapter 1 of Genesis, God worked for six days creating all the plants and animals, the sun and the moon and the ocean. On the last day, he made humans in his own image, creating man and woman at the same time. Chapter 2 of Genesis seems like a continuation of the story, but it isn't. The Bible contradicts itself here by saying God created Adam before any other animal, meaning man was not made on the last day. Then the Bible says when God could find nothing suitable to keep Adam company, he made Eve from one of Adam's ribs. It might not seem like it until you really think hard, but these are two totally different stories back to back in the same book. It's this kind of contradictory storytelling that leads scholars to believe the Bible was written by a handful of authors stitching together much older stories. Also, scholars think chapter 1 was written by a Jewish priest 400 years before chapter 2. It was meant to discredit Babylonian creation myths, dethroning Marduk and Tiamat. To further prove my point, Adam isn't even known as Adam until close to the end of chapter 2. Up until that point, the author or authors simply call him the man. It's as if somebody came in later and decided to give the Mystery Man an actual name. Although, to be fair, it isn't the best name. Adam comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which means dirt. In China, the first man and woman were also made from dirt. The goddess Nua walked among creation, but found herself growing bored and lonely. She paused at the bank of a river and fashioned the first humans out of clay. In ancient Roman mythology, the gods created all of the animals but found they were too dull. They chose to create the first humans as more intellectual beings that could keep things interesting. In Egyptian myth, Amun ordered the god Khnum to create the first people by molding them on a potter's wheel. Across the world, the first man and woman were almost always molded from the very earth. The Proverbs of Amenemope Ancient Egypt was home to some of the greatest literary minds that ever existed. Sadly, most of the texts are lost. The few texts remaining are often fragmented, with archaeologists only finding pieces of them written on scraps of papyri or pieces of clay. One of these works, a piece known as the Instruction of Amenemope, is akin to an ancient self-help book. It was written around 1300 BC and contains 30 chapters on how to live a successful life. Even more interesting is that scholars have compared it to the book of Proverbs in the Bible. The instruction of Amenemope is all about self-realization and being a good person. The book encourages the reader to respect the elderly, to be nicer and defend the weaker classes in society, to look after the poor and be wary of authoritarian figures with too much power. It even says something along the lines of the meek will inherit the earth. The author writes that the man who goes about his business in peace will receive divine blessing. However, the man who makes a nuisance of himself and complains about petty grievances will be destroyed. It almost sounds like Amenemope was talking about ancient Egyptian Karens. The wisdom within this ancient text is incredibly biblical. All the most important teachings of Jesus can be found within its 30 chapters. Lessons on modesty, generosity, and self-control. The book also discourages things that would become deadly sins in Christianity, such as pride and gluttony. 
For those who have read the Book of Proverbs, you can see the similarities already. In 1924, renowned scholar Adolf Ehrman published a list of the similarities between the Egyptian text and Proverbs. Adolf was convinced the 30 chapters of the instruction of Amenenope were directly related to the 30 sayings in Proverbs. I'll even give you an example. The first quote is from the Bible and the second is from Amenemope. Have I not written for you 30 sayings of counsel and knowledge? Look to these 30 chapters, they inform, they educate. The similarities are as clear as day, right? The truth is that scholars are beginning to realize just how strongly Egypt influenced the world around them. Many biblical books took inspiration from Egyptian wisdom. It's just that most of the ancient Egyptian texts have been destroyed or will likely never be found. The Real Eden Ancient Greek playwright Euripides said Zeus and Hera were the original Adam and Eve and the original inhabitants of the Garden of Eden. I've already talked quite a bit about Adam and Eve duplicates today, so now I'm going to focus on the garden. What I'm going to say will surprise you. To the Greeks, the Garden of Eden was a real place. They called it the Garden of the Hesperides. You can see remnants of the ancient tales in countless pieces of Greek artwork. There are oil jars and scraps of terracotta with pictures of Hera picking apples from trees in the ancient garden. This was one of the most important stories in Greece 2,500 years ago. Yet unlike Hercules, Perseus, and the Minotaur, and other famous Greek legends, this alternative and older version of the Garden of Eden has mysteriously been suppressed. It's almost as if someone doesn't want word getting out. Here's a shocking tidbit of information for you. In the Bible, it does not say anywhere explicitly what kind of fruit Eve ate from the tree in the garden. The idea that she ate an apple came from the Greek version. In Greek myth, the Garden of the Hesperides was full of delicious apple trees. The garden even came complete with a serpent. Only the serpent didn't lead Hera to temptation, it enlightened her and Zeus. In the book of Genesis, written in the 6th century BC, Eve is described as the mother of all the living. Also in the 6th century BC, Greek texts described Hera as the mother of all. The Greeks and the authors of the Bible even put their legendary gardens in the same place, somewhere in the far west where the sun sets. Could it be that ancient civilizations knew where the Garden of Eden was, but came up with different names for it and slightly different stories? The Moses Problem Sargon of Akkad was a mighty emperor who ruled 4300 years ago. From 2334 until 2279 BC, he was in control of the unstoppable Akkadian Empire. He was such a legend that he went down in history as a mortal god. Despite being a powerful king, Sargon's coming-of-age story is as humble as they come. Ancient cuneiform texts describe how Sargon transformed from a meager orphan to a ferocious king. Oddly enough, his story is almost the exact same as the story of Moses. Sargon was the illegitimate son of a priestess. His mother worked at a temple dedicated to the goddess Inanna. He never knew who his father was, and because of her place in the temple, his mother could not reveal her pregnancy. Nor could she keep Sargon as her own. She placed him in a basket upon his birth and let the basket go floating down the Euphrates River. Let me pause in the middle here to say that this is the same thing that happened to Moses. He was born to humble parents during a time of unprecedented chaos in Egypt. An unnamed pharaoh was worried about the Israelites becoming too numerous in his kingdom, so he declared that every male child be killed, thus preventing the Israelites from having more babies. Afraid for her child's life, Moses' mother sent him adrift down the Nile River in a basket. Moses had the good fortune of being discovered by the daughter of the very pharaoh the Israelites were terrified of. The pharaoh's daughter was bathing in the river when baby Moses floated to her in his basket. He was taken in by the princess, grew to be a prince, and then it turned out he was a great prophet for the Israelites. As for Sargon, he was discovered floating down the river by a gardener who worked for the king of Kish, a Sumerian city. He grew up in royalty and ultimately became supreme emperor. It does seem a little suspicious that Sargon and Moses were abandoned in a river and then discovered so fortuitously. Historians think Sargon's story may have been propaganda. It could have been his way of trying to distance himself from the god kings of the past, appealing more to the common folk. On the other hand, the story of Moses was likely a copy. The tale of Moses was written down almost 2,000 years after Sargon was dead. The Maya Flood 
It's highly unlikely the Bible took any inspiration from ancient Mesoamerican legends. You know, since the Bible was written on a completely different continent, that doesn't mean the Bible isn't connected to the people of Mexico. The Maya had their own sort of Bible, a book known as the Popol Vuh. Within its pages are stories that mirror stories told on the other side of the globe. The most common story is that of the Flood. Both the Maya and the Aztec had legends of an apocalyptic flood. According to the Popol Vuh, the Flood wasn't even the first time that human beings were wiped out. The creator gods were having a very difficult time creating creatures to worship them properly. Three times a unique race of human-like beings was created, and three times they refused to pay proper homage to the gods. Each generation of creations was destroyed. The last race to be wiped out were washed away in a flood, with the few survivors being eaten by wild animals. The fourth attempt was a big success. Finally, the ancestors of the Maya gave praise to the gods and spared themselves disaster. In Aztec lore, there's an almost identical myth involving creator gods restarting the Earth over and over again. The planet was on its fourth restart when the flood destroyed everything. It had already been reset three times, each time because humans were being annoying to the gods. But on the fourth time, people became more than just annoying. They grew far too wicked. Humans were lustful and rude, and no longer worshipped Tlaloc, the rain god. Seeing no other choice, Tlaloc wiped everybody out with a flood. This ushered in the fifth era of the world, with only a few survivors from the flood left to procreate. Love songs everywhere. Out of all the books in the Old Testament, the Song of Songs is without a doubt the most abnormal. It's not necessarily unusual as a piece of writing, it's just that the book doesn't fit with the rest of the Hebrew Bible. The Song of Songs has nothing to do with the history of the Israelites. It contains no prophecies or revelations. It doesn't have any moral tales to tell, like in the book of Job, nor does it have any esoteric wisdom for living a morally incorruptible life like in the book of Proverbs. Instead, the Song of Songs is essentially a group of love poems. Not just any love poems, a sensuous collection of love songs in the form of poems without any moral, theological or religious undertones. It's so widely open to interpretation that there have been times where the Song of Songs has nearly been scrapped from the Bible. The most widely accepted interpretation is that it's not a love song but an allegorical poem for the love between God and the Hebrew people. According to modern scholars, this is an excellent example of mental gymnastics. The poem is without a doubt about the love between two people. Not just that, but its origins are pagan. The Song of Songs was most likely an imitation of the oldest love poem in the world. It's time to get controversial. In the Book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 5, to be exact in case you don't believe me, there is a passage about King Solomon. It says the wise Hebrew king worshipped and adored Astarte, the Canaanite goddess of love and procreation, also called Ashtoreth. Astarte was such an important goddess that even the king of the Hebrews loved her. Although it's also worth mentioning that he worshipped Molech, the evil god of the Ammonites. This has a lot to do with the Song of Songs, don't worry. In the Canaanite culture, it was customary for a passionate love song to be sung during the sacred marriage ceremony between a newly crowned king and Astarte. It was the Canaanite equivalent of swearing in a new president. The new king would be figuratively married to the goddess, and a magical hymn was sung as part of the ritual. But the ritual is even older than the Canaanites, going back to Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia roughly 4,000 years ago, songs were sung during the sacred marriage ceremony of the Dumuzi Inanna cult. Dumuzi was the mortal king of Erech, with Inanna being the goddess of fertility and procreation. Nobody knows exactly how it happened, but a cult formed around the king and the goddess, connecting their names for eternity. It came to be that all new kings in Sumer were figuratively married to Inanna, with a love song being sung during the traditional ceremony. This most ancient of love songs passed from Mesopotamia to the Canaanites and then to the Bible. It's believed the Song of Songs is a collection of pagan ritual hymns. But why has it managed to stay in the Bible for so long, especially when so many other books have been kicked out of the official Bible? What do you think about the Song of Songs? Do you think it has a place in the Bible? Let me know in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. The Greek Nephilim 
Did the Greeks know about the Nephilim even before the Bible was written? It's possible for a few reasons. The Greeks told plenty of stories about giants. They also told stories suspiciously similar to tales from the Bible concerning the creation of abominations. In ancient Greece, giants were foul creatures. They were believed to be the children of Uranus, who was the sky, and Gaia, who was the earth. In other words, giants were a product of the heavens and the mortal realm, but they almost didn't even make it to the surface. Uranus did not want the giants to be born because he was afraid of their power. Uranus imprisoned them inside Gaia's womb until Kronos, leader of the Titans and father of Zeus, freed them. It's important to remember that the giants of Greek myth were neither god nor titan. They were middling abominations, creatures who held allegiance to the titans but were different beings altogether. When Zeus defeated the titans, the giants attacked the gods of Olympus. It was an epic battle known as the Gigantomachy, and the giants lost. Zeus then locked the giants underneath mountains where they remain to this very day. The Greeks were telling stories about giants long before the Bible was ever written, though there is no specific date as to when Greek myth began. In the Bible, the story of the Nephilim has some serious parallels to Gaia's children. The Nephilim were created by a group of angelic beings sent by God to watch over humanity. But instead of watching humans, the angels defiled human women, and the women gave birth to ungodly abominations. Angels being from heaven mixed their seed with human women being from earth. In other words, the Nephilim, like the Greek giants, were born of a union between heaven and earth. For years, the Nephilim were a plague on the world. They bullied humans and caused chaos everywhere they went. They were also filthy cannibals and consumed humans as food. God was so furious at the angels responsible for the creation of the Nephilim that he cast them down into the bowels of the world. Just like how Zeus imprisoned the giants under mountains, God imprisoned the angels under the earth. Are these two stories identical? No, not totally. But you can definitely see how the author of the Bible may have been inspired by earlier Greek tales of the ferocious giants. Yahweh and the Old Testament I've been telling you all about biblical stories that were inspired by tales woven centuries before, but I haven't really told you why. I haven't explained the creation of God, Judaism, Christianity, and why it makes sense that the Bible may have dabbled in some light plagiarism. I'll start in the 14th century BC. The earliest tribes of the Hebrew people did not worship a single god, something the Bible outlines very clearly. They worshipped many gods, gods that came to them from all over the globe. One of these gods was Yahweh, a principal deity. But there were lots of principal deities, with Marduk in Babylon and Re in Egypt. All these different cultures worshipped a huge pantheon of gods, but there was always one main deity. In most cases, the most important deity was the one associated with the sky, rain, or the sun. Getting a monotheistic religion started was not an easy thing to do in the ancient world. There were too many gods and too many various cults obsessed with one particular deity. In the 14th century BC, when the Hebrews were still praying to many gods, something crazy happened in Egypt. A pharaoh by the name of Amenhotep IV changed his name to Akhenaten. Then he ordered all Egyptians to worship a single god. The name of the new god was Aten, a deity of the sun. The pharaoh, who may have been the pharaoh from the book of Exodus but nobody knows for sure, abolished Egyptian religion. The pantheon of gods crumbled. Osiris, Horus, Re, they were all banished in place of the new Aten. The plan didn't work. The pharaoh died and his son Tutankhamun got rid of Aten and everyone went back to worshipping all the gods they wanted. At the same time this was happening, the Hebrews were worshipping Yahweh, Baal, El, Asherah, Astarte, and many other deities. Then around the 10th century BC, maybe the 9th, the Hebrews did something that Akhenaten failed to do 400 years earlier. They elevated Yahweh to the status of supreme deity. It was no longer acceptable to worship multiple gods, but rather Yahweh as the one true god. As time wore on, Yahweh no longer needed to be named. He simply became God. To reinforce the monotheism of the new religion, a book was created. Around 900 BC, the first pages of the Bible likely started to be written. They wouldn't become official until between 600 and 400 BC. It took a very long time for the book to be made. It needed to be filled with stories that discouraged people from worshipping many gods while encouraging them to embrace the rule of Yahweh, aka God. 
It isn't that the Bible necessarily copied stories from other religions. It's more that during the centuries it took to create the Bible, the authors were inspired by tales as old as time. Before Yahweh was made the only God, the Hebrews worshipped deities that had been around for thousands of years already. Those deities came with stories about floods, love, morality, etc. Many of the stories were simply incorporated into the Bible. And the Bible, of course, became the foundation of Judaism. What are your thoughts on the creation of God? Let me know in the comments and thanks for watching. Remember to hit subscribe if you haven't yet and come back soon for more awesome stuff from the channel.